live edition here with Johnny Canzano. Johnny Cans, how are you, sir? I'm good, man. I'm excited. <laughs> nothing like live, right? There's nothing like live. That's what I, you know what? Because Jim asked me that question. He's like, I don't, why do you want to do it live? Like, what, what's, and I just said, because, and you know what this is like. And he, he's like, uh, I never thought of it like that, but okay. See, I always think it's like live performance theater. Yeah, like I need that 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 little bit of live juice every yeah. day, and I miss I miss that a little bit. Yeah, look, you you don't get do overs and retakes in real life. You know, right. you're this is this is real life. I love it. Let's let's do this, man. Uh, all right, let's uh, let's break it down. Uh, John uh, joins us uh, every single week. It's uh, brought to you by Zeke's Pizza, best selection of pizza and local uh, Northwest craft beers. Visit Zeke'sPizza.com. In fact, you can put your uh, camera phone up to that QR code. That is going to take you right to Zeke's Pizza. Also, uh, read all of John's work up there at JohnCanzano.com. Listen to his radio show, The Bald Face Truth, in Portland on 750 The Game. Uh you want to start first with the 25 schedule or you want to start first kind of a, your overall evaluation first two weeks of the Northwest schools? Uh, let's talk about the first two weeks because okay. it's it's not just the Northwest schools. I mean, if we look back at the schools that were previously in the Pac-12, those 12 members from a year ago are now 21 and two, Puck. Uh, <laughs> the product, the football product was never the problem here. It was bumbling presidents and commissioners who overplayed their hand. And so, uh, you know, the Northwest schools all being undefeated. All looking good at times, bad at times. Um, I find it interesting, too, that we kind of judge Oregon State and Oregon, Washington State and Washington by different standards. There's a lot of that going on, particularly in the state of Oregon, is Oregon just hasn't looked great, hasn't looked like the number three team or the number five team or even the number seven team. I, I keep joking around, like Oregon's like three wins away from being out of the top 25. Like it's, they just keep dropping and, and, and winning games, but not looking great. But I'll point to last season in Washington. Washington played like six or eight games where they were clunky. They didn't look great. They found a way to win. I'm kind of wondering in this CFP expansion era, if Oregon is built to kind of look like an NFL team. Remember the Chiefs mm. lost six times last year and had a real bad run in the middle of the season, but won the damn thing. So let's keep an eye on Oregon. I'm giving them a wide berth, but they haven't looked great. And it's created a lot of intrigue with this Civil War game because Oregon State has stuck to their identity, found their identity, whatever you want to call it. They are running the football. They are playing defense. They go on the road to San Diego State, shut out the Aztecs, and have suddenly made this uh, Civil War matchup standing room only and very interesting for Beaver fans. Conversely, I think Washington State's got maybe the best body of work. You look at the win over Texas Tech, dominant performance against a Big Sky team that just was not competitive. I think Washington State's got a lot to feel good about. I was really surprised to see that spread open at eight, eight and a half points. It's been bet down to four and a half, I think justifiably so. But, you know, Washington State, Washington, Apple Cup. I'm just kind of looking, Puck, at Washington and Oregon and trying to find out, like, do the kids who play for those schools, a lot of them new, do they understand this rivalry? Do they understand what happened a year ago? Because Oregon State and Washington State do. And I'm curious to see how that plays out on Saturday. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Fish did, I think Fish did a good job yesterday, at least ta- talking about it as press conference, you know, what it means and d- to have the rivalry so early in the season. And I like what he said. He just said, listen, you, you play games like this and the practice is just different. You know, we always try to say, you know, right, right, Pete Carroll was famous for this, and Fish worked with Pete Carroll. Oh, it's it's championship week. Every week's championship week. <laughs> it's such a bunch of BS <laughs> because you treat games differently. And I liked hearing that yesterday from Fish, and I think Dickert even talked about it. It's just different, and it, it always should be different. It's, it's different how Oregon is preparing differently for Oregon State. And the same, and you can say that for every rivalry that we have in sports, and it's okay uh, to admit it. You, you asked me on your radio show uh, yesterday, uh, you know, a question about if if Wazoo were to lose, what would it do to the fan base? And I, I thought about that a lot. I, I thought about that too much uh, yesterday. So I don't like you planting that Good. in my like head. Hannibal Lecter, man. Yeah, I love I, I that. <laughs> but I, but then it, it got me thinking: who needs it more this weekend? What Ooh. what? Who needs it more? Ooh. Beaver fans or Cougar fans? The win. Ooh. Um, Ooh, that's good. Uh, I mean, I think it would say if either one of those schools wins, it's going to say a lot for the Pac-12 and the Pac-12's mission and the message that Jake Dickert has been preaching since last year. We belong, we belong, we belong. So either one wins, you get the we belong message. 
But but I think, you know, it, wouldn't it be a bigger win for Oregon State to knock off the higher-ranked Oregon team? Uh, that said, I think the Pac-12 would take them both and take either. And I think, you know, these games, we always say rivalry games, you throw out the records. Well, it's so early. I don't even know who these teams are yet at this yeah. point. So uh, I don't know if we're throwing records out, but I think it's very interesting. Um, I have a hard time believing, though, that, you know, Oregon's got 13 transfers that, that could start among the top 22 on their depth chart. You know, do those kids understand what happened here? And, and we'll find out. But, um, you know, I think it's going to be great. They're standing room only tickets at Research Stadium. They're being sold. So they're sold out. Um, yeah, Ann McCoy, the AD at Washington State, told me the ticket sales are about 38000 They're still soft for mm -hmm. the Apple Cup. But I think a lot of that was the pricing. But for Washington State fans, you know, this is it. Like, people are watching. You have to show up for your team. You have to understand that these games are important to Washington State and Oregon State. You know, uh, I know Oregon wants to play this game as well, wants to continue the series. Washington wants to continue the series in part because they get to, uh, you know, get, you know, in Oregon's case, they get on a bus to go play a road game. And they could, leave, they could not leave the state of Oregon playing their non-conference schedule for the foreseeable future. So, uh, and Oregon State gets a big home game on their season ticket schedule. And we'll get to 25. And that, I think it's really important. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you, you know, we, we talked about this a, a little bit, you and I. Um, it feels like, and I told you, it feels like that there is more apathy with the Wazoo fan base. And maybe, and now Wazoo fans maybe will like come after me and say, you're crazy. It's just my perception. And maybe it's unfair. I went to the first game, the Portland State game, Labor Day. It wasn't well attended. I get all the excuses. There is always an excuse sometimes with us. It's Labor Day. <laughs> the opponent's not good. The way, it was too hot. And I, and I love our fan base to death. So Cougar fans do not take this the wrong way. <laughs> but there just always seems to be an excuse sometimes for us why we can't go there. Why we can't show up? San Jose State in a couple of weeks. Well, it's on Friday. I'm not going. Well, well, okay. I mean, it's but there is always something, and so I wonder. You don't get a sense from Beaver fans of any apathy, do you? I mean, there's a little bit of anger, and there's some Beaver fans who don't want to play the Civil War, and you have to explain mm. to them like getting a Big Ten team to come to Research Stadium every other year for the foreseeable future is huge. Not having to get you know put an opponent to pay opponent to come play you. Uh, being able to bus 40 miles to play that game, it's huge. Uh, Oregon State's AD, Scott Barnes, told me he wants to play every sport, Civil War, he, every sport back on, unless there's a good strategic reason not to do it, they want to play those games. They're going to play in baseball, they're going to play in basketball, they're going to play in football, need to play those games. But there's some Oregon State fans who are saying, hey, I'm so angry still, I don't want to do it. But it's, it's not apathy. I saw, you know, the Oregon State fans showed up at San Diego State it looked like there were about three or 4,000 yeah. fans there. There were the home game, and the opener was a Big Sky opponent, just like Washington State. Very different inside Racer Stadium. A lot of fans, a lot of energy, a uh, bit of a catharsis for the fan base. I heard fans kind of talk about, oh, it's nice just to see football again. Stop mm. talking about all the nonsense. Um, so Washington State, look, I get it. It's Portland State. It was a hot day. But you've got to tune in. You've got to show up for your team because – uh, they are currently about to complete their 2025 schedule. They're going to start. Go, they're going to go to market with that and try to negotiate with the CW, try to negotiate with other partners, and attendance, viewership, those things matter. We found mm. out in the re last time of realignment. So if you're upset, you could be hurting and apathetic. You could be hurting your team. All right, let, let's get to that, that that 25 schedule. You have it up at johncanzano.com. Uh, I would encourage uh, people to go there, read it. Uh, please subscribe, do a gift, do a donate there to uh, to, to do, uh, John's website at uh, johncanzano.com. What's the latest? It's it's not all finalized yet, but what do you know of, of who the Beavers are going to face in 25 and who the Cougars are going to face uh, in 25 as of now? Well, they, they each have six games already on the schedule. And in, you know, Oregon State's case, it includes, you know, obviously they play each other. Washington State and Oregon State will play each other. It includes a Civil War game. We've got a game with Texas Tech. We've got a game with Houston. Um, you know, they got, uh, you know, they got the schedule starting to come together. So six games there. Washington State also has the six games that everybody knows that were pre-booked on their schedule. A couple of things that have come up. The Mountain West Conference, who they, you know, they fell apart on an extension uh, of the of the deal that was going to extend that, that partnership, that scheduling partnership, the mountain West, uh, you know, and, and PAC 12 far apart. 
Um, there seems to be uh, a little bit of uh, coldness forming, a cold front forming between these two entities. And some of it obviously is related to the fact that the Mountain West is playing some defense here. But I've, I've been told that uh, the Pac-12 is trying to finalize the 25, 25 schedule. They were, they're were working with Dave Brown, who is the scheduling guru, who does all of this stuff. He's a savant. He is putting together the schedules. They're piecing them together. They were trying to get some Mountain West opponents here or there, cherry pick maybe the best matchups they could get. And the Mountain West Conference is blocking that and saying you cannot schedule any games beyond uh, the first three weeks of the season. Um, and the Pac-12 schools are saying, look, this is a, obviously an intentional move to make life difficult for us. Gloria Navarre, the, Mount, uh, the Mountain West commissioner, told me, hey, this is just per our policy. This is how we operate. But I'm getting some eye rolling from Washington State and Oregon State who are trying to put the finishing touches on the schedule. Um, Puck, I'm told it's not going to look like a straight alliance or partnership with another conference. It won't just be, hey, the ACC is going to play six games against the Pac-12 schools or the Big 12 is going to play six games. It's not going to look like that. It's going to be piecemealed together by Dave Brown. I expect something here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, I'm told they are putting the final touches on this. They have the matchups, the handshakes. Contracts are not signed. Of course, things can happen. Of course, something somebody could come in from left field. Uh, Oregon State, I'm told, uh, has uh, a little ACC flavor on their schedule. They're already playing Cal. Washington State's already playing Virginia. But you look at the ACC teams, there are a bunch of ACC teams who have some open dates, including Stanford that's got two open dates. Keep an eye on them. Miami's got an open date. Notre Dame, which is uh, you know kind of an ACC member but not, has got an open date as well. Uh, but I'm being told that the schedule in 2025 – will be better than the schedule in 24 as it pertains to power four level uh, opponents. Uh, they will then finalize that and then they'll go to market, as I said. And, and the CW is the natural partner here. The CW has got this appetite to expand, have more inventory. Um, if these games are more attractive than the stuff the, C the CW is carrying this season, the low level ACC games and these Pac-12 Mountain West games in a lot of cases, um, I expect the CW to be at the table and put a bib on, right, and, and be interested in this. There could also be some other partners. I find that interesting. And then the Pac-12 has hired Navigate, this Chicago-based firm mm. that has worked behind the scenes throughout realignment, worked with Oregon, worked with Gonzaga, worked with some conferences. Really smart firm, data-driven. They're moving into the media space. It feels to me like they're getting their valuation on what their 2025 season and what these two schools are worth in a potential move to another conference someday, they're probably getting some direction from Navigate. I think it's a smart move by the but, but, but you don't see anything, any relationship, you know, in twenty five with another conference. I don't see at this point, no. And I and I asked that specific question of a couple sources who were involved and they said it's not tracking that way. They've had those discussions. Teresa Gold, the Pac twelve commissioner, obviously would have talked to the Big Twelve, would have talked to the ACC said, hey, is there something here that we can do that would bridge us to uh, you know, a full alliance or a full partnership for the 25 season? I'm told that's not where it's headed right now. And, you know, uh, and also, look, they, the schools want to be done with this, the scheduling part of this, sooner rather than later. Uh, they want to be able to say to fans, hey, this is what we're playing in 25. We're not going to leave this hanging over the heads of potential kids that are players who might get into the portal. They want to, I think, to put this to rest in the first half of this college football season and then get about finding out like, what is the value? What will the CW pay for these games? And, and uh, you know, certainly I think, um, you know, everybody, not just in the PAC 12 footprint and in the state of Oregon and Washington, I think people outside those footprints are looking with curiosity to see what happens. Mm. You know, we, we touched on a little bit earlier and you talked about Oregon's schedule and, you know, what's happened here in, you know, the first two weeks, you know, they, they didn't look good against Idaho and, you know, Idaho's, you know, probably a better football team. They realize Boise State's going to be real good. I mean, they've got perhaps maybe the best running back in, in the country. Um, and well, statistically he is, and, and they continue to win. He's going to be in the conversation for the Heisman trophy. Um, I, I just, can he coach, you know, we've talked about this before and I, I don't know, man, I just, can he recruit May I guess he can. I mean, they, they're, they have a great class. They've got great people that work on that staff that can recruit Tosh LaPoy, uh, LaPoy's is defensive coordinator, but, but at the root of it. And the game is on the line. Can that guy actually coach John? 
Yeah, I, th- I think it's it's a philosophical question. You have to ask yourself, what is coaching in this era? Um, I think we look at basketball. Look, I covered Indiana basketball, and Bobby Knight was a tremendous teacher. He wasn't the best recruiter. He was a great teacher. He could develop. Guys wanted to play for him. I also covered Tark. Tark wasn't as great with the teaching part, but man, could he recruit. And what Tark did is he had great assistants on his staff. He had Tim Gergerich on his staff. He had John uh, Welsh on his staff. He went out and got guys that could work, get into the gym and work with players and develop them. So the question for Dan Lanning isn't can he coach, although that, that's the big umbrella question. He's a fantastic recruiter. He's recruited on a level that nobody has seen at Oregon. The question is, does he have the right staff around him? And I think we're going to find that out as we watch this talent either develop or hit a low ceiling or struggle to get together. Tosh Lapoy is defensive coordinator. You know, uh, Oregon makes him a D coordinator, gives him $1.7 million when they hire him. He had been a coordinator at Alabama for one season. And he was stripped of the defensive coordinator play calling duties by Nick Saban in the middle of that season. It, it wasn't like he had this great record of calling games or developing players. Oregon brought Tosh Lapoy into the equation because the guy can flat recruit. And that's part of coaching. But I look at the staff as a whole, Puck, and, and you've got to have some gray-haired guys on your staff that know how to coach, that know how to develop, that have seen some stuff. And that's where I look at Dan Lanning and I kind of go, okay, we're going to find out. And I, I like that there's some adversity early because it looks like Idaho outcoached him, although Oregon may have just shown up and said, we're going to go vanilla today. You know, I talked to Jason Eck, the Idaho coach, and he said, you know, they didn't show anything on offense we hadn't seen. So no wrinkles. They just played it kind of straight and thought they're probably going to win the game. Boise State, Oregon played maybe one really good quarter. The rest of it was really clunky, disjointed, offensive line problems, seemed to have figured something out in the second half. We'll see this week against Oregon State. But if they don't fix this, the, the narrative for the season is going to be, man, they had a $200,000 Bentley, and they're struggling to drive this thing. And so I think a lot of eyes, a lot of pressure on Dan Lanning. I also think the guy welcomes it. It's kind of his, you know, his thing. He's not going to run from this. So I'm interested to see how Oregon plays and if, if Oregon can pull itself together. The, another thing you and I have talked about is kind of just this transfer portal era. Are we watching some teams in the early part of the season that are transfer heavy, that are just struggling to gel, struggling to find chemistry, culture? Um, Dylan Gabriel's not Bo Nix. Um, you know, he's maybe that was unfair for fans and media to kind of say, okay, the guy's going to be Bo Nix. Uh, but there's some stuff going on with more than just Oregon with transfers and teams trying to find rhythm. Yeah, it's um, you know, it's you know, it's interesting to kind of watch them and, and just watch them, you know, kind of uh, you know, move as as a staff together and, and to see what they can do in the, in this you know in this new conference. I, I don't know, they're just something when I watch him coach and I, that I'm just not convinced that he's actually the guy, you know, that that he can sure. actually you know get those big wins and and we'll find out. I mean, maybe, maybe he does, maybe get maybe gets over the hump. But well, that's what the if, job. I mean, that's 100 yeah. percent the job. You take that Oregon job. You know, 10 wins in season one, people were disappointed. Of course. And, you know, and then they beat Liberty. It's not their fault that they got Liberty last year. They had a better year. So I like the trajectory, but, you know, you look at the losses. There's three yeah. losses to Kalen DeBoer, a loss to Jonathan Smith, a loss to Kirby Smart. You know, it's not like Gary Anderson's out scheming them here, but let's see what happens in the next couple of weeks. I think Oregon's just trying to find some rhythm right now. What, what do you think about uh, Jetfish so far in the first two weeks? You know, they've got off to these slow starts, uh, but at the end of the day, they, they find themselves with, with blowout wins. If you didn't watch the game, you come back and just look at the box score and see the, see the final, you go, oh, it's a dominant win for Washington. Uh, well, what's the takeaway in the first two weeks of watching him navigate, you know, his new team and his new city? I need a bigger sample size like everybody else, but I, I, there's, just, there's a calmness that he's brought that I like. And it's a poise. There's a calm. It just, you know, I'm watching him even when they're not playing well at times. And I'm thinking, you know, he doesn't seem too worried. He looks like a guy who's in this for like it's a marathon. And, you know, he's looking at his splits in the second mile going, okay, I need to pick up here, or pace myself there. But, um, you know, big test Saturday that I think Washington State's going to uh, bring a punch. And let's see how Washington takes it. What do you think of Mateer? 
The, it's so funny to watch. It's so funny that, you know, I've been, listen, I have been ball washing this guy for two years, John Mateer. <laughs> He's your guy. And, and then when I remember the first series against Portland State and he looked terrible, I'm like, oh, my God, this is <laughs> not good. Idiot. I'm an idiot. Bad take. La, la, last week, I mean, we just, you know, that school has never seen a quarterback like that. You know, I've, I've made this comp and I've made this and I've said this several times now on a bunch of different shows that he reminds me so much of Jake Locker. I mean, he just it's probably because he wears number 10 as well. He's a little bit shorter than what Locker was, but the same type of athlete, same arm, everything. It's just, it's, it's odd to watch him. He might be a little bit quicker than Jake, but I mean, Locker was sensational. And I just think it gives them a whole new arsenal to throw at Washington because I think the one thing, and I think Husky fans would admit this in the first two weeks, their defense is not what it used to be. Uh, they're very good in the secondary, but up front, they're, they're not that good. Uh, as of yet, they haven't shown that yet. And teams have been able, Weber and and um, and Eastern Michigan last week were able to move the ball on them. And, you know, when a play breaks down, I mean, what do coordinators hate? They hate the running quarterback. And to me, he clearly is the, the number one and X factor in that game on Saturday. Yeah, I think, you know, Washington State, you have to ask yourself, what are they looking for from that position too? Because... Uh, if I'm Washington, I look at game one and I'm going, oh, we, this guy can beat you with his arm. And and then you look at game two and you go, OK, wait a minute. He can beat you with his legs. I think you've seen enough to know that uh, he's this is a quarterback who's capable of winning games in different ways. Right. I mean, it's it's obvious. But, uh, you know, Washington State wants to play defense. Puck. They want to run the football, play defense and have Mateer come over the top of that and really hurt you when you're concerned about Sean Parker or somebody else breaking off a 50 yard run. I think Washington State's dangerous this week. If Washington does not show up to play, they will get punished. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I just I think it's gonna be it's gonna be a fun game. It's gonna be a weird game. It's a weird game because of of the timing of it. Sure. The fact that it's not at the the, the traditional time slot. Okay, but and, wait and all instead of it's being odd. like traditional Washington State fan and spinning that into a negative, yeah. Think about the blessing of that if you're a Cougar fan. You don't yeah. want to play you know, brand new coach, brand new regime coming in. Uh, there seems to be a little bit of, you know, you saw it in, we in week one and two at Washington. There's a little bit of figuring out things sure. going on at Washington, like all first year coaches and new programs do. You want to play Washington in week three. You don't want to play them in November. They're going to be better in November, albeit they're playing better competition. And their schedule gets brutal at the end, but that'll be a better team by the end of the season. If you're Washington State, you got to get off the bus now. You want to play them on Wednesday. Play them Thursday. Like the sooner you can play Washington, the more advantageous. I, I agree with that. That that I I agree with you a hundred percent. The the time from a football standpoint, the X's and yeah. O's. The the time to play them is right now because of you know and Jed Fish in in week eight, week nine, or at the end of the season. You're right. It's going to be a much better football team than they are right now. Yeah. And look, don't get fooled by week one. You know, Portland State, I talked to Portland State about, you know, how that game got away. And, you know, Portland State subbed out five starters on defense in the first half. And I really think some of the big sky teams are trying to win. Idaho was trying to beat Oregon. And some of them are trying just to not get hurt for their regular season. They're not saying it. They're taking the paycheck and they're pulling a bunch of guys out of the game. But I think we got a good taste of what Mateer and Washington State can do. I love the receivers. I like the running backs. Uh, and the defense is always going to be good with Jake Dickert. Conversely, Washington's going to walk in there, and they're going to treat it like a rivalry game, too. This is fantastic. I'm glad we're getting this instead of, you know, Georgia Southern or some game that doesn't matter. Get, give me give me your picks. You, oh. you are really oh, – because you really are boasting yourself a I lot. Am. I'm doing well. JohnCanzano.com. What, what's your record right now overall I'm, and against the spread? I'm 25-1 and one picking games straight up right <laughs> now. And I'm 19-7 and seven against the spread. Now, I haven't fully looked at either of these games, and I tend to not look at them until about Wednesday night, and I make my picks Thursday morning. Because I want to hear more. I want to know, yeah. you know, who's playing, who's not playing. But, you know, I can tell you I started the week and I saw that eight and a half points sitting out there with Washington State. And I was like, that's easy. Mm -hmm. I would take Washington State and the points. I would take them right now, take them all day long, because I think that is a really close game. And I think Washington State could win it outright. I think Oregon State's in a different predicament. Oregon State, I, you know, I've watched two of games up close 
And they are a team that has to go five to seven yards at a time. They don't have the game-breaking receiver. They don't have backs that are going to run away from linebackers and defensive backs. So Oregon State has got to keep that game in the 20s to have a shot to win. And they have to keep Oregon from ripping off 59-yard slant passes for touchdowns and punt returns for touchdowns and kickoff returns from touchdowns. And that's what Oregon does because Oregon's got five-star guys that can take it to the house anytime they touch it. So, you know, I'm a little more concerned for Oregon State because they are just a couple big plays from not being able to stay with Oregon. But I like both Pac-12 teams in points right now, just given how things have gone. And Oregon State is now getting 18 and a half at home against Oregon. Uh, you know, and Oregon has not looked great. I mean, I think right now I'm leaning towards taking points in both Washington State and Oregon State. But I'll give my official picks Thursday. That's where I stand today. Okay. Are you? Is a last thing for you. Uh, I know you've seen the Shadur Sanders post game where yeah. he throws his offensive line under the bus. Is the is the shine off them now? Yeah. I mean, come on. The shine was off the uh, Colorado, you know, act last season down the stretch. Um, you know, it, it, it reminds me a little bit of, you know, when you see a good club basketball team or, or team USA in Athens, right? I covered team mm -hmm. USA in the Olympics. You look at the talent and you go, okay, there's NFL talent on that team. I, you know, I, I like Travis Hunter. I like Shadur as a passer, mm -hmm. but then you start to look at how does it fit together? And the question you raised earlier, can they coach? You saw his coordinators wanted no part of him after last season. They bolted. You're throwing your offensive line under the bus. You can't do that. It feels more and more to me like this, you know, Colorado football is a club football team that, you know, uh, the parent of one of the best players is coaching. And beyond the two or three players he really cares about, I kind of wonder what happens to them if they have, uh, if they lose this week to Colorado State, do the wheels come off? Uh, they're not a bowl team. They can't run the ball. They can't stop the run. And they're, uh, you know, Shadur Sanders is sitting out there on an island. I feel bad for him in a lot of ways because I think if you put him in a good system with competent coaching around him, I think he would shine. But when you put him in a system where everybody knows they're not running the football and the defensive line can pin their ears back and come after him and the offensive line's not that good, um, I worry he's not going to finish the season, that there will be an injury to him and – uh, I just I just don't see it going beyond this year with Colorado. I I think if it implodes, you could see Coach Prime go, I can't win here and take a job somewhere else or follow his kid into the NFL. There he is, uh, John Canzano. It's all brought to you by Zeke's Pizza, the best selection of pizzas and local Northwest craft beers. Uh, visit Zeke'sPizza.com. Hit that QR code. It's going to take you right there to Zeke's Pizza. Of course, you can follow John on X at John Canzano BFT. Read all of his work at JohnCanzano.com, including the latest on the uh, 2025 schedules for Oregon State and Washington State. And he has got a world-renowned radio show. The uh, PortlandGazette.com <laughs> called it the second best show wow. in portland <laughs> exciting thanks fuck uh you are the best thanks for doing i hope it all went well for you yeah it did thanks man i appreciate right, you there he is uh, john canzano uh, who again joins us every single tuesday